All right, so we are going to talk about what we, where we left off last time, and this time we're going to be a little bit more formal when we talk about uh, discrete probability, and also some of the terms, and we are going to have some interesting recursive definitions that we'll be talking about today too. So today's lecture is going to be eh, a little bit on the abstract side, uh, which I think is going to be okay, um, especially since I'm using my tablet now to help explain some of those concepts. So we are going back to the counting module, which is this one here. Um, and it probably is opened already in one of these tabs. So I'm just going to look for that. New, mm, new, new pigeonhole principle, GDB. New. Okay, maybe not. Alrighty. Okay, it's all right. It's not already up yet. So I'm just going to clean up some of these other uh, tabs that I don't need anymore. Yeah, this one I don't need anymore. This one I still want here. Okay, so today is another day where the big operator thing that we talked about, I think at the very early part of the semester, it's going to be coming back because it's going to be helpful to use you know, those notations. So we'll take a second pass and second look at those notations now that we know what is a function and a lot of the concepts that, that we didn't know before. All right, so we are currently in discrete probability and we are looking at the counting module. So I'm going to close that one. And just open this up. All right. Let me uh, magnify the text a little bit here. So we are going to talk about both uh, general counting and without replacement. And also and then we get to the permutation outcome set of experiments without replacement and combination outcome set of experiments without replacement. Because with replacement, guess what? Things are actually pretty easy to work with pretty easy to understand. All right, so we'll go ahead and start with general counting. So what we want to take out of this is um, if the set of outcomes per trial is identical between all the trials, then things get a lot more simple if you want to just count the number of total possible outcomes for an experiment. In this particular paragraph or in this particular section, uh, uppercase T of zero is indicating this is the outcome set of trial zero, outcome set of trial one, outcome set of trial two, and so on. So when you have M of these, the last one is um, indexed M minus one because we started counting from zero. So when you look at the uh, total outcome set of the entire experiment, it is just a Cartesian product of all of these little T of I's. And I'm using this notation here, you know, because I'm uh, actually I'm multiplying. I'm really actually multiplying because if we on, if you're only concerned about the um, cardinality of the outcome of the entire experiment, this makes sense, okay? Because each level it is um, branching out by the same number. So let me go back and kind of re-explain what this means, okay? So we'll go to the tablet because you know, it's easier to explain these things using a graph concept. Now the graph concept is great for explaining um, the concept when the numbers are small. On the other hand, you know, when the number gets big, uh, it becomes almost impossible to visualize using a graph, but it's, good, it's great for explaining concepts like these. So in this case, I'm just gonna say T0 it's the same thing as T1, it's the same thing as T of M minus one. And that is just, um, well, to save myself you know, a lot of you know, drawing, we'll just say that there are three elements in the set, okay? And then we say there are three trials, three trials. All right, so this is representing the starting point, And then we basically using the first trial we, bra we branch it out to one, two, and three. So this is representing T0, where the outcome of T0 is um, zero, one, or two. Now, after T0, we have T1. So this is representing T of one. 
but t of 1 is going to look like a miniature of t of 0, right? Because t of 1 can also end up, you know, has an outcome of 0, 1, or 2. And it also has 0, 1, or 2. 0, 1, or 2. And if we push to uh, talk about T2, okay, same deal, right? Because you uh, it also has the same outcome set. So we have 0, 1, 2. And this is where, you know, having a tablet is going to be helpful because you know, what I can try to do at least is to copy and paste. There we go. Oh, um, because my my hand touched something, it won't let me move that anymore. Okay, there we go. And ideally speaking, it's probably better to copy and paste, you know, the entire thing. So now we can, I can copy and paste your know, nine items at a time. But I'm just gonna do the same thing, you know, because. Sometimes you know, the lasso tool does not grab onto items you know, the same way that I really want it to. So it's better to have just do it individually. It's not that big of a deal. There we go. But the point is, you know, since I'm doing something that's really uh, Yeah, that looks zoomed out, doesn't it? Nope, that's not what I want. Um, let's try one more time. There we go. Not quite, you know, but close enough. I mean, you guys get the idea. I mean, that's... Mm, yeah, not quite, but close enough. Okay, there we go. All right. So I did not do such a great job, you know, spacing out, you know, in T1. So, you know, things don't get aligned very well when we get to T2. But that's okay. Um, you know, basically, this connects to here and this connects to here. There we go. So, um, so what, we'll pick one of the leaf nodes and find out, okay, what does that mean, right? So we'll take this one out, okay? You know, this is uh, one, zero, one as a three tuple. It is one of the outcome of the entire experiment. When each uh, trial of the experiment is to take one thing out of three, um, and we do it three times, and with replacement. In other words, whatever we take out of the bag, we put it back into the bag before the next trial. So the way we describe this one, okay, the way we describe each one of these outcome is there are a few things. One is it is with replacement because you can see that uh, we can end up with zero, 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 okay? Yeah, which is zero, zero, zero is referring to this, this leaf node here. Um, so that means, you know, yeah, we can end up with exactly the same outcome with every single trial in the experiment. Uh, so it's with replacement. And the second thing is ordering is important. Ordering is important. <coughs> because you can see uh, 0, 1, 2 and 2, 1, 0 are two distinct out, uh, outcomes. So I will find 0, 1, 2 first. Okay, so 0, 1, 2 is right here. It is one of the 27 outcomes of the entire experiment. And 210 is all the way down here. It is also a distinct and different um, outcome of the entire experiment. So ordering is important. It is with replacement. And so in these cases, you know, and I will just write more, one, more, one more item here. Okay, the outcome set. Is the same 
for all trials. So this is the easiest one to analyze and the easiest one to draw, you know, in the picture, because you can see that, you know, each with, with each layer, it is really just, you know, like this, this tree here, that is just compressed a little bit, it becomes this tree over here. And that tree, when you compress it a little bit, it becomes this tree here. In other words, we, we are really using the same tree. And we are just, you know, expanding um, using exactly the same, you know, three fan out ratio uh, kind of tree until we get to the same level, the level that we need based on the number of trials. So this is the easiest one to analyze and easiest one to uh, generate as well, okay, because, you know, it's just, we don't have to worry about uh, what about these things that should be considered duplicates of each other. Well, no, there's no such thing as a duplicate because ordering is important. <clears throat> and each uh, outcome is a is a three twofold because there are three trials in the experiment. So that's the first one. And then we will take a look at the text again. So with this one, it's the easiest one. And then Section four talks about what about without replacement? In other words, what if you know replacements are not um, one, you know, once we take something out of a bag, we don't put it back into the bag for later trials. So that becomes a little bit harder to to um, to analyze and also to draw the picture just a little bit because each uh, layer of the tree looks different from the previous layer. They are related except they're not the same, okay? So we're gonna look at, you know, the same thing here. Okay, so this time we'll say T0 is the set of zero, one, two. And this is without replacement. Okay. And ordering is important. Okay, so we'll even mention that ordering is Important. All right. So with this one, you know, the first level of the tree still has three possible outcomes, right? So we, we still have zero, one, and two as the three possible outcomes out of the first level of the tree. But then once zero is out, okay, once we, oh, okay, you cannot see it because I forgot to switch the screen. Okay, there we go. So once your know, zero is chosen as the uh, first, as the outcome of the first trial, it's no longer available to be chosen again because you know, we are basically saying this is without replacement. Once you take something out of the bag, you, it is no longer available to you in all the uh, future trials in the same experiment. So that means you know, in the second um, trial, we only have one and two left. Assuming out of the first trial, zero is chosen. And over here, if one is chosen first, then we only got zero and two left as the second trial. And if two is chosen first, then we only got zero and one as the available choices for the second trial. So this is basically T0. Now this is not exactly T1, okay? Because your know, T1 in this case, is only referring to one and two, assuming T0 is you know, taking out zero. T1 is gonna be zero and two only as a set if one is chosen from uh, T0. And you know, in here, we have T1 being zero, one as a set when two is chosen out of T0. So, you know, so this label T1 is a little bit of a, um, it's okay as a label to represent which trial we are talking about, but it's not exactly describing what set is your T1 anymore. It's not a very clear indication. So if we are to move it one more fur one step further, which is T3, okay, I can T3 right here. Then out of here, we only got two left. Out of here, we only got one left. We only got two, zero, one, and zero. So, <clears throat> so if you look at this graph, you know, this picture of a tree and versus the one from before, um, you go like, hmm, that's kind of interesting because the previous one is a lot more 
there are a lot more leaf nodes. There are 27 leaf nodes. And then with this one, we only got six. That's because you know, with each layer of the tree, we reduce the number of fan out or branch out by one. Um, you can see how you know, with the first level of the tree, we have a fan out of three. With the second level, we only got a fan out of two. And then with the last one, we only got a fan out of one. So um, this is, you know, uh, the, so when, when you look at the um, experiment, you know, and the entire, look at the entire experiment, <clears throat> and you're only concerned about the cardinality. So most of the time we're only concerned about the cardinality if we are uh, just trying to calculate probabilities. But a lot of times, you know, your algorithm that has to handle um, discrete probability, sometimes it actually has to figure out, you know, what the individual try, uh, what the individual outcomes are. So in those cases, you still need to maintain, you know, what exactly is the set. But in this case, we're only concerned about how many things are in the set and not so much um, uh, what is each individual item in the set. So in this case, um, it is done by P of NM, okay, so P of NM, where N is the number of um, items to begin with, and then M is the number of trials. So I'll make it clear, N is uh, basically the cardinality of T0 initially, you know, what, how many things do we have? And then M is the number of trials. And we talked about the P notation from before. This is the number of permutation. It has its own um, expanded form to use um, uh, factorial. And uh, so this is from a previous lecture. So, you know, if you have not written down the definition, you know what to do, okay? You know, because definitions are really important. And instead of me writing the definition out every single time, maybe it's time for you to track the definitions from a previous lecture or read the notes, okay? It's also in the notes too. So this graph is not too bad, okay? And what we'll do next is to look at the same thing, but ordering becomes not important, okay? Because that becomes kind of interesting. So what I'll do is I am going to um, use the lasso tool. Okay, make a copy of this part, move to the next page, paste that in. All right. So this time, we're looking at the same thing, right? You know, it looks almost exactly the same thing, but this time we're going to say, what if um, we're looking at uh, a way of counting where it is, once again, without replacement, okay, so because you can see each trial is taking one thing out of the bag, but that thing is not put back into the bag for a future trial to use, okay? And we also want to say that in this case, ordering is not important. So in this case, you can see that, you know, every single leaf node is a duplicate of the other one because the output of um, the leaf node here is representing 0, 1, 2. But since ordering is not important, it is really representing not the tuple 0, 1, 2, but rather the set 0, 1, 2. So over here, we have 0, 1, 2 as an outcome. This one, we have 0, 2, 1 as an outcome. Over here, we have 1, 0, 2 as an outcome. And then here, we have 1, 2, 0 as an outcome. And, you know, I mean, you probably know the drill here. This is, oh, okay, I cannot talk and write at the same time. There we go, 2, 0, 1. And then over here, we have 2, 1, 0 as an outcome. So when you look at the set, the set of all the outcomes, which are these you know, quote unquote you know, six you know, sets here, you, you, you remember what we talked about on day one of this entire semester. 
these are all the same sets. <laughs> so in other words, in this specific case, the cardinality of uh, the outcome of the entire experiment is just one. <coughs> because ordering is not important. You know, and if ordering is not important and every single time we get the same three elements out, you know, um, then they are basically the same outcome. So that's why, you know, things are slightly important, slightly, slightly, well, slightly interesting now. Because in this case, the outcome is actually, each outcome for the entire experiment is a tuple because ordering is important. So this is one, two, zero, which is you know, this not the same as two, zero, one, because even though these two tuples have exactly the same values, uh, they are ordered in a different way. So that's why you know in one, ordering is important, which leads to the use of tuples. The other one says ordering is not important, which leads to the use of sets. And that's the main difference between, you know, um, whether uh, whether ordering is important or not, you know, how it affects the counting. So in this case, in general, big omega, you know, the cardinality, cardinality of big omega is the C of n m. So once again, n is the cardinality of T0. How many things do we start off with in the bag? And then m is the number of trials. So uh, we are basically, you know, looking at the com number of combination, and we also have defined your know, C of n m before, and you know you probably should have that definition sitting in front of you somewhere, or you should be able to find that definition um, because we talked about it. It's also in the notes here. All right, so as far as counting is concerned, these are the equations that we, are not equations, but these are the formulae that we need to use. These are the definitions that we need to use. The problem is, what if we are not only concerned about the cardinality of omega, and instead we are also concerned about the actual membership of the set omega? Then things get a little bit more icky. Okay, so we'll take a look at some more definitions in the notes first, and then we'll come back here to take a look at, you know, how does that work. There we go. All right. So all of these are explaining, you know, how the math comes to be, the math that we talk about. So... It's important to read the notes, okay? All right, so now we get to section six. So now section six is looking at the outcome set of an entire, of, ex of the entire experiment when we are looking at the permutation, which means ordering is important, uh, but without replacement. And there are a few equations here. The first one is, um, the base case, which is uh, omega zero of t is the set of an empty tuple, <coughs> where t is representing the pool of choices initially presented, or you, you can see it as t zero, and then the notation of omega i of t represents the outcome set of an experiment involving i trials, starting with t as the set of trial outcomes. Okay, so let's go ahead and start with the, the base case here. So the base case is basically saying, okay, let's start with a bag that has you know, this, I, this many items in it. Okay, we start with a bag with you know, five different marbles in it. And the experiment is to say, um, choose nothing out of the bag and put it into a little tube. I, I choose a little tube here because the tube means you know when the order that you put the marbles in becomes important because you know each mar I'm assuming the tube is has the same uh, inner diameter as the marbles themselves so you know that means you know the tube is a good way to represent 
you know, ordering of you know, how you chose things. So in this case, we end up with an empty tube because, hey, um, there was, I, I, I told you to take nothing out of the bag. So by the end of the entire experiment, what's in your tube? The tube is empty because we didn't choose anything. So that's the base case, okay? It seems to make sense, okay? But you still have an outcome, okay? Because when you look at uh, the set notation here, it means you know, we still have a non-empty set of outcomes, even though you were, you were asked to take nothing out of the bag. Now that part is really important because you know, um, even when you're asked to choose nothing, the cardinality of the outcome of the entire experiment is still a non-zero. Now, how do you know that is the case? You just have to look at you know, the definition of uh, P of nm, and you basically plug zero into m and see what happens. So if you plug zero into this m here, which is the number of trials, you have zero trials in this case, then you have n factorial divided by n minus zero, which is just n factorial n factorial divided by n factorial divided by n factorial is indeed a 1. So that means, you know, even from the perspective of the uh, permutation, the, the way to compute you know, the number of permutation, it still makes sense. All right. So, okay. So we look at this base case and go like, okay, even though it's it seems like it doesn't make sense because I'm still kind of hung up on why is this not an empty set, but instead is an empty set with an empty tuple in it. It's not an empty set, I should say. It is not an empty set. It is a non-empty set because it has a single element of a empty tuple because you're basically saying, oh, my tube is still empty when this entire thing is done. So the next case is to look at, okay, so once we figure out what is the uh, omega zero of t is, what about omega i of t? So assuming i is not zero, then omega i of t is gonna look like this. Oof, okay, that looks, that looks really ugly, doesn't it? Okay, so when you see something this ugly, uh, the first thing you do, what, is, what do you do? Well, you kind of have to first understand the notations, right? So this is a big U notation, and I'm using, I'm iterating through all the elements of T, and then this generates you know, one item that I'm going to use for the big union here, and but each one of these is going to be dependent on which E I choose out of T, and one element can only be chosen once you know, out of this loop here. All right. So at this point, you know, it's probably best to take a look at um, a concrete case. But before we go, I'm, I still have to kind of describe what this entire thing is. So the big U notation means we are taking a big union of a bunch of stuff. And, you know, for, for each item in the big union, for each iteration, I'm picking one unique element out of T. So that means I'm, I'm not going to reuse the same element twice. And the way I use that element E is I will create a set. This set is uh, the element E in its own set, Cartesian product with omega I minus one, and then T minus um, uh, the set of E here over here. Okay, a few things that are important is, is this set notation really important? The answer is yes, okay, because you cannot have a Cartesian product between something that is not a set and a set. They both have to be sets. So that's why, you know, this needs, the element E by itself cannot be used in Cartesian product. It has to be first turned into a singleton, which is basically a single element set, before we can use it to uh, Cartesian product with something else. So the second part here is also you know, really important because this is a recursive definition. Because what will be Cartesian product or what will be Cartesian multiplying you know, this set of E with? Well, we basically say, um, so since for trial I, or for this trial, we chose um, E out of the entire thing. So that means T minus the set of E is what is left in the bag 
and I have I minus one trials you know, left to perform. So this entire thing is now recursively representing the outcome of the, the sub experiment after I take E out of the bag and E is now located at this part, okay, at the beginning part of the tube from the perspective of this experiment of you know, having I trials. Okay, so if this description is not helping you, then the next thing you can do is to come up with a uh, simple example and then we work it out. All right, so let's work out a simple example here. So we'll ask initially, um, let me switch to the tablet first. Okay, so we'll ask initially what is omega 2, so that means it'll be, have two trials per, to perform of the set a, B, C. Okay. Well, the first thing you need to say is, uh, is two, does two equal to zero? Mm, doesn't sound like it, right? Okay, if two does not equal to zero, then we cannot use the, the base case. And then we have to break it up into big U. Okay. So we'll, we'll rewrite this as big U, where E is coming from. A, B, C as a set, and then for each iteration, we have whatever E we choose for that iteration, turn it into a set, a singleton set, and then Cartesian product that with uh, big omega 1, because it, remember it's supposed to be 2 minus 1, so it is 1 this time, and then we take whatever T has, whatever A, B, C has, okay, and then minus whatever E is from that. E is a variable, A, B, and C are not. <coughs> okay. <coughs> so at this point, I have just done a substitution, you know, based, based on the definition. So now here comes the real hard work, okay? The real hard work is, uh, so how do we expand the big U notation? So the big U notation can be expanded. You know, this is one way to do it. Um, so one way to do it is to basically use uh, a comment piece and say, what if E equals to A for the first iteration, E equals to B in the second iteration, and E equals to C in the third iteration. All right, so in other words, we are breaking it up into three components. The first one is what if, you know, uh, we choose A to be variable E, and then what we what if we choose B as variable E, and what if we choose C as variable E? Well, then the rest is really just you know, substitution, right? Because you know, whatever E is, we substitute it with A and continue with that. Okay, so that means you know whatever is in parentheses in this case is basically the set of A Cartesian product with omega one. And now we know exactly what the set is because it's A, B, C minus the set of A, which means only B and C are left over here, <coughs> union with B as a singleton set, Cartesian product with omega 1 of, okay, it's A, B, C minus B, so we only have A and C left, union with, <coughs> Uh, the, single, the singleton set C, Cartesian product with omega 1 of, um, let's see, this is AB, okay, so because C is used, so we only got AB left, and we need one more close parent here, one more close parent here. So that's how we expand or we spell out the iterations, you know, through the big U notation, and then we you know, basically this part here, okay, let me point here. So this part here is really just comments. Um, in, in other words, it's not really a part of the equation. So we'll just comment out this part here. <coughs> there we go. All right. So you look at this and go like, uh, that's still not helping. What is oh, big omega 1 of BC? Okay, so let's let's work out that one. So um, omega one of B C 
is okay so first thing is to check whether one is zero or not one obviously is not zero so we are not getting to the base case yet so we still have a big union here so this time e is an element of b c and then for each iteration once again we take whatever e is make a singleton set out of it uh, Cartesian, Cartesian product of that with omega zero now and then since uh, E is taken out so that means we have B C minus the singleton set of E here <coughs> all right so this is this is copied straight out of the definition so the next thing we do is we expand it into once again you know the iterations so the, for the first iteration, we'll say, what if E has a value of B? And then for the second iteration, we ask, what if E has the value of C instead? Okay. Well, then we just kind of expand the whole thing. It becomes you know, the uh, singleton set of B, um, Cartesian product with omega zero of um, we are looking at B, C as a set minus B, so only C is left in this case. Okay, and then with the next one, it is kind of the same deal, but because uh, C is chosen as E, so this is where we end up with. Okay, so you look at this and go like, okay, we are not quite done yet because, you know, we still don't know what is omega zero of C is. So we now look at omega zero of C. Well, look at zero. Is the zero equal to zero? The answer is yes. So that means we know the answer to this one already because it is just a set that has an empty tuple in it, like so. Okay. So with this one, we go like, hmm. That means, you know, both this thing here and also this thing here is basically um, a set with just an empty tuple in it, okay? So what we do, I'm just trying to think of, you know, what is the best way to do this? Because, you know, do I want to do a whole bunch of replications or do I want to, uh, how do I want to approach this? <clears throat> okay, I think I know how I want to do this. Okay, we we'll take this chunk, copy it, move on to the next slide, paste, move it up to about here. Okay, there we go. Okay. So what we're going to do here is to do a bunch of substitutions, okay? So what we do is we just, you know, edit the original thing and say, oh, we know what that is. Oh, I forgot that I have chosen to use that eraser tool, and I'm going to change it back to a... That, okay, there we go. Okay, there we go. Excellent. So now we go like, hmm, that is just, oh, okay, I forgot to switch back to my pen first. So now we switch back to, this is just an empty tuple here. This is an empty tuple here. There we go. And we want these two to union. But what is that exactly? So what is, um, so technically speaking, what we end up with here is um, a tuple with B that has a second item that is an empty tuple like this as one set, and then we union that with another set that has a single two tuple that starts with a C. The second item is the empty tuple itself like that. But, so now we basically say, how do we treat an empty tuple being inside, well, generally speaking, how do we treat nested tuples? So there are, depending on the context, you know, there are different ways to uh, look at this. But in this case, we are looking at, we basically flatten 
uh, the tuples. In other words, you know, we just you know, look at everything. We concatenate the content of all the tuples together, but we do not allow a tuple to be inside another tuple. So now, based on that observation, this becomes just B. Okay. Okay. Let me use the mouse pointer here. This becomes just a single uh, with a tuple with a single item of B because this part here is collapsing into nothing. It, it, it is a tuple, but it contains nothing. So when we flatten the tuples, we become just, it com becomes just B and a union with <coughs> uh, C over here, which then becomes just a set of two tuples. One is B and one is C over here. All right, so is does that make sense to you though? Okay, does it make sense? Because what we are working with here is to ask you you're to conduct an experiment with only one single trial. You have a bag that has B and C in it. You are only allowed to choose one item out of the bag, <coughs> choose one marble out of the bag, and put it into a tube. So what are the possible outcomes? In other words, you know, considering all the possibilities, what can the tube end up looking? So you go like, um, well, since I'm only allowed to choose one thing, uh, the, I could have chosen B and put it into the tube. We end up with P, B in a tube. Or we could have chosen C and put it into a tube, and that's why we have, a C, we have C in a tube. So these two are not concurrent um, outcomes. They are basically alternative outcomes for this entire experiment. Every single element out of the outcome set is an alternative outcome of an experiment or trial. It is they're not concurrent, meaning that they are not happening at the same time. All right, so I hope you are now convinced that omega 1 of BC in a set is really the same, almost the same thing, except your know, B and C are now you know, their own uh, singleton tuples, um, but they are still in the set, like so. So knowing this, okay, we can now go back to <coughs> the previous page, because now we say, oh, okay, so we have this already figured out, we got this figure out, and we got this figure out, because even though the, we only got this one figure out, the mechanism to figure out this one and this one over here are identical, except we don't have BC, we have AC and AB instead, okay? But the mechanism would still be the same. So that means now we can lasso, you know, this earlier part here, and then we'll expand based on what we just did on yet another slide. Well, suppose we can put it here. Okay. Yeah, that looks about right. Okay. Okay. All right. So what this means is now we can. <coughs> no, 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 no. That's not right. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Maybe should uh, I, I think I got the right thing lassoed, but I didn't copy it. That's why when it pasted, it was still pasting the wrong thing. Either that or I lassoed the wrong thing to begin with. Could have been the other one. So copy, move over here, paste. Yeah, this time it looks about right. All right. Okay. So we fix that location, switch back to the pen tool. Okay. So now we, we are basically saying, yeah, we know what this thing here, basically it's this, this, this thing here boil down to. So we now say, yeah, we know what that is now. It is just a silly set with two items in it, a singleton tuple B and a singleton you know, tuple C. <clears throat> and likewise, 
We also know what this one is supposed to look like. It is a set with A and C as singleton tuples. And then with this one, we also know what it's supposed to look like. It is a set with B. Oh, okay. Well, that's fine, but you know, I wanted to say A first. A and B as a singleton tuples. And of course, I have to adjust the, the close parameter a little bit here. Okay. All right, so that means you know, we, are, we can figure this out now, okay? So out of this one, out of the, out of this one over here, we have um, basically A, B, A, C. So we, so I'm do, I'm going to collapse the unnecessary tuples, you know, as I perform these steps here. So now this one is just your know, A, B, A, C. And then we look at this one here is B, A, B, C. And then we look at the last one here. And that would be what? Let me see. It is going to be C, A, and C, B. There we go. C, A. CB and since we are making a big union out of these things and we do not see any overlapping that means we just end up with um, everything in here except you know, we, we don't write it as three different sets of you know, being union together we just you know, say this AB AC BA BC, CA, and then CB, and that's the final answer. So there we go. So this uh, outcome generator does work, okay? It, it takes a little bit of time to kind of understand what it means and, you know, why we have to create these singleton sets and also on top of that we also have to understand that when you have <coughs> a tuple with nested tuples in it we basically quote unquote collapse you know all the structure of the tuples so that we only take whatever the tuple has you know as the remaining items in the overall tuple so you know other than those you know quote unquote fine print points um, everything else is still based on what we have done up to this you know for this class up to this point all right so normally in a in a regular class I would have said you know are there any questions and then I'm gonna pause for like 10 seconds or something like that obviously when I'm recording this it's not gonna work so I'm just gonna move on and continue so the next one is you know what about combination so when you think about combination, you know, there are, there's one quick and easy way to deal with combination. You know, the easy, quick and easy way to deal with combination is instead of using uh, a Cartesian product over here, um, all you do is you specify a union instead of a Cartesian product. Um, actually, I take it back. There's actually a, okay, there's a mistake here. Um, there's supposed to be an omega one here, and that's entirely missing. So that's that's not good. But I, what I'm referring to here is the Q of I uh, omega of I definition. So instead of using a Cartesian product here, which is how we made the tuples, we we, we can put a union over here. Now the the thing that makes it more difficult to uh, it's not just you know, replacing the Cartesian product with a union because if you replace the Cartesian product with a union then we just end up with one gigantic union we need to have a each item here has to create a set of sets 
so that when we union, we are we are basically combining the uh, the set of sets over here. So instead of having a single union here, we have to put the entire thing, you know, into its own set. <coughs> Um, so that when we perform the union, it will be, you know, union I union in okay, you know, making a union out of, you know, uh, set sets of sets, Oof. okay. So that's one way to look at it, but there's also a different way to look at how to generate uh, the combination outcome out of an experiment without replacement. So because I don't want to use omega again, I choose to use you know the new. Uh, symbol u of i, so u i of x represents the set of all possible combination outcomes of an experiment with i trials, and the set x represents the set of choices available to the first trial. So kind of the same deal, you know, x is taking the place of t, uh, u is taking the place of omega, and i still has the same meaning, which is the number of um, trials. So as just like the previous one, we look at the base case first. Okay, I give you a bag of five marbles, and I give you an empty bag so that you can store the marbles that you take out of the original bag. And then the instruction is take nothing out of the original bag. So now the question is, what is the outcome? So once again, the outcome is not an empty set. You still have the empty bag that I gave you earlier. So the empty and it's only one possible outcome is you end up with just an empty bag. So let me repeat what I said earlier. The experiment is me giving you an empty bag, we'll call this new bag, and you're supposed to use the new bag to hold on to things that you have chosen out of the original bag, we'll just call that your old bag. The old bag has a bunch of items in it, it's called X. <clears throat> let's say it's, it has five marbles, it doesn't really matter. And then my instruction to you is take nothing out of the old bag. So what is the outcome you know, from this experiment? It's not nothing. You still have that new bag that I gave you, except it is empty. So the outcome is always one single possible outcome, which is the empty new bag. And that's why it is a set of a empty set here. The outer set is the set of outcomes, and then the inner set is the only outcome coming out of this experiment, which is an empty bag itself. <coughs> so it should make sense if the previous, you know, section six makes sense, this one should make sense as well. So now what we do is we take a look at um, what we are going to do with this here. So you can see the notation is very similar to what we had before. So ui, assuming i is not zero of x, is going to be, um, you know, take the big union for every unique element of x, do the following. Okay, you can see there's a bunch of following here. So this one looks kind of <coughs> iggish because what it does is the recursive call is right here. The recursive call is right here. It gives us the, the combinations of choosing i minus one out of x minus the set of e, you know, um, items. So this is the recursive call. The recursive call should give us a set of sets, okay? At least one set, but most likely multiple sets. We take each and every single one of those possible outcomes of the sub-experiment. We take that outcome as S over here. And then what we do is we just say, okay, so here's the outcome from the sub-experiment. Just union that with E, which is you know, what we have chosen for this iteration of this big union over here. So you can see that this is really just a really awkward way, but to do exactly the same thing as what we did over here, and this is also what I said earlier, the Cartesian product becomes a union, except we also have to put a set over the entire thing. So in, in other words, because, because Cartesian product automatically generates um, the container, which is a, um, 
uh, a tuple, but a union does not do that. So we have to put an extra set notation around the entire thing because without that, then we would have dissolved you know, the boundary between the um, alternative outcomes, and basically they all turned one big mushy you know outcome thing, which is the original set. That's not going to be helpful. So that's why we need the extra boundary of an extra set notation out here to basically emphasize that you know we take s out of the recursive call or the return value of the recursive call, and then we make a union of this outcome with e, which is what I have chosen for this particular trial, uh, which is an, a, a, a certain element of uh, that I can choose from. And that becomes the actual new outcome for this level of the experiment. <coughs> <coughs> All right. <coughs> but the idea is the same. Okay, if you look at the general idea, it is the same between section six and section seven. So the next question is, is there a better way to generate, <coughs> I have to, <coughs> excuse me, my, <coughs> mm. give me a second here. Okay, I'm not sure whether that actually paused the recording or not, because I thought it paused the recording, but it may not have paused it. All right, so recording should be resumed now because the icon is really confusing in uh, OBS, but I think the caption on the button says, you know, it says, you know, if I click the button, it would pause recording, which is which means it is unpaused at this point. Let's hope that is the case, and I'll double check. Nope, nope, that's just my email. All right, <coughs> all right, so I can check that by looking at, oops, no, that's not the right one. No, all right, here. All right, so we'll take it one more time. Yep, okay, so we're good. I'm just looking at the timestamp here uh, it just you know, bumped up from 53 to 54, meaning that the file is being updated now. So I think I'm recording again. Okay, cool. <coughs> all right, getting back to the uh, to the algorithm of how to do this, all this stuff. So the question is, is there a better way to generate um, a combination outcome set? The, the, the reason why I, Ask the question is because, um, as you can probably expect, there will be a lot of overlapping, you know, um, set where the union is going to take care of. Oh, this set is really the same as that one over there, so they would kind of be merged together, or they will be combined into one single one after the union <coughs> occurs. <coughs> so that takes a, that wastes a lot of resources. So the answer is yes, there is a better way to do this, but it relates to an earlier topic that we have talked about. Um, because the more efficient way can only work if we have a set of elements that are uh, that can be fully ordered. So if you have a set of elements that can be fully ordered, then you can have you can have an ordered list of these elements. Then what you can do is to make a recursive you know, function where it will just recursively uh, choose the first element and then you know whatever is left it would um, it would choose from let me see how should I should put it it would it would pick the elements in the sorted order so you know once something is chosen what is next okay what is going to be chosen next can only be values that are greater than or equal to the one that you have chosen already. So that makes the, efficient, the algorithm far more efficient compared to what we are dealing with here, because this one is very um, inefficient 
because it'll, uh, it's going to find a lot of duplicates and then it doesn't know that these are duplicates until it performs you know, all the operations. So it's not efficient at all. The other way is generating um, sets that cannot be overlapping and as a result you know, they are far more efficient <coughs> from that perspective. So um, I guess one of the things we can do for this class is to uh, really have a um, have an, uh, have a program have a programming assignment to generate all of these things. Either that or um, generating uh, lotto tickets, like you know, uh, lotto tickets of a certain winning combination. That actually may be fun. We can go back to talk about that. <coughs> all right. So, so this particular um, note is already, I mean, this particular module is already done. So I will leave it around you know, just in case it'll be needed. And what we'll do is we are now moving on to discrete probability as our new module. All right, so we'll take a look at this one. All right, the first thing it does talk about is uh, terms again. So it talks about outcomes, it talks about events. So outcome we have already talked about, okay? The set of outcomes is a set of all possibilities of an experiment. So each element of the outcome set is representing an entire outcome of an entire experiment. <coughs> an experiment in, in return is a series of trials, blah, blah, blah. So we talked about this already. Now we have to explain what is an event. An event, on the other hand, is a subset of omega. How events are constructed depends on the application or probabilities. For example, in a Powerball lottery, a particular event may include all tickets that win a particular prize. Probability is, in general, expressed as the cardinality of the event divided by the cardinality of the omega. Given that the set E is an event, of course, this also assumes the chances of each element in E is identical. Okay, we talked about the birth, uh, birthday problem already, so let's go back to talk about the lotto problem. So we'll go back and look up you know, the lotto game. So this time we'll look up the California Powerball lotto. There we go. <clears throat> And this time we want to know, you know, what are the probability of winning a specific prize? Because there are actually multiple levels of winning, quote unquote winning in Powerball. And let's look up the rules. And then we'll probably play. I don't know whether that will tell us all the various ways of winning or not. Past winning numbers. This is not bad, okay. All right, so these are the ways that you can win uh, in a game of lotto. So five, so what the first number is, is you know, how many um, numbers on your ticket matches you know, the uh, five numbers that were drawn for the, you know, basically the lotto ticket. And the Powerball is independent on its own. So if you match five out of five, and then plus the, also match the Powerball, uh, the price amount is 20 million. If you only match five of the numbers, but not the Powerball number, uh, the winning the price amount is 141,543 dollars. If you match four out of the five plus the Powerball, there's one ticket winning in on October 14th. And that person you know, made uh, thirty-six thousand two hundred thirty-five dollars out of that ticket before tax. Yes, you know, after tax is not gonna look close to this amount. This looks like a good chunk of money. You can buy a car barely these days with this chunk of money. After tax, you cannot buy a car with this money anymore. Anyway, so there are different ways of winning. Um, <clears throat> in lotto, meaning that you get something out of it. So let's just focus on this one here, okay? What are the chances that I make eight bucks 
out of my lotto ticket. One way to make 8 bucks out of a lotto ticket is to match 3 out of the 5 number, but not the Powerball number. The other way to make 8 bucks out of it is to match 2 of the 5 lucky numbers and also to match the Powerball number. I want to know my chances. I want to know how likely I am going to get 8 bucks, you know, which means I really just make a net gain of $6 out of my you know, ticket, my $2 lotto ticket. Okay, so that's my problem. So the first thing we need to do is to de define our event. Okay, so let me switch back to the tablet here. So we want to define the event here. So the event is going to be consisting of tickets that match three out of five of the winning numbers. So those are called the winning numbers. The five numbers <clears throat> chosen from 1 to 69 for uh, each week is called a, the winning numbers, but not the power ball. But we also want to make a union with another set, which are the tickets that match two out of the five lucky numbers or winning numbers. And also the power ball itself. Okay, so the power ball number has to match the actual power ball number for the second set, but not for the first one. <clears throat> this is our event set. So now we have to ask, uh, okay, so what are these numbers here? So you have to think about it in, um, in a very specific way. Okay, so we'll just, uh, we'll simplify the whole thing. And then we'll ask, you know, um, what does a ticket look like in each category? So we'll assume, okay, assume the winning numbers are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay, what are the chances that they are exactly 1, 2, 3, 4, 5? I don't know. I don't care either. Okay, this is just an example. It's easier to talk about it when the winning numbers are just 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So from 6 to 69 are the not winning numbers, the losing numbers. Okay, and we'll also assume the uh, the Powerball number is just 1, okay? So from 2 to 26 are the non-matching Powerball numbers, okay? <clears throat> so now we want to look at the, what type of lotto ticket is in E itself, okay? So if you think about it, okay, you, you can, some people may say, Oh, so that means you know, if my lotto ticket has one, two, three in it, and a Powerball number uh, of say two, then it is in, okay, so I'm gonna use this as a ticket here. This is in E, okay? You go like, mm, not quite, okay? Because you know, a lotto ticket has five numbers. If you only specify one, two, three, what are the two missing numbers on the ticket? You go like, it doesn't matter because you know, we only need three out of the five winning numbers, so the other two numbers do not matter. Well, they actually do, okay? They actually do because um, it, they cannot be four and five. They have to be anything but four or five. So that means this is not a good way to describe it. You can say one, two, three, and then, uh, six and seven plus a powerball number of two now that is a very good way to specify a ticket that is in the event set that we are interested in meaning something that will make us you know not make us eight bucks you know, but it will give us a <coughs> price money of eight dollars okay so that's one um you can uh, there are many other ways right you can have one three five and then you can you can have 60 and 61 
and then with a Powerball number of, I don't know, 16. Yeah, that would do it too. Okay, that's also in E. Uh, we also have things that only have two of the winning numbers, um, and but the Powerball number is gonna match. So that means you know, one, four, and then we just have a bunch of non-winning numbers like um, 30, 31, 32. But we do want the Powerball number to match, so that's the one. That is also in E, okay? So we want to do this because we want to get an idea of what type of ticket is in the event set, okay? Okay, so you look at this and go like, hmm, okay, but we are interested in the cardinality, right? Because you know, we can write a program to generate these actual tickets. That actually would be a fun homework assignment. However, okay, so I'm keeping that in mind. Mm -hmm. Yes, I generate ideas as I go. So, um, but what about the cardinality? How do we do the counting here? <clears throat> So the way we look at this is to look at it from a much more uh, systematic way of looking at the ticket. So we look at the ticket, okay? So we want to handle each case individually. So the first one we want to handle is what if we want three winning numbers, but not the Powerball number. Okay, so you, then you look at a lotto ticket because ordering is not important other than um, yeah the ordering is not important so you want these three to be uh, chosen from the five winning numbers now you have to look at these two and be very specific about what those two can be because these have to be chosen from the 64 non winning numbers and then this one has to be chosen from chosen from the 25 non-matching Powerball numbers. There we go. Okay. And the way we do this is independent. In other words, how we choose the three out of five winning numbers is completely independent of how, from how we choose the two out of the 64 non-winning numbers. And those two events are also completely independent to how we choose one of the 25 non-matching Powerball numbers. So that means you know, we, we got three subproblems here, and then for each subproblem, we apply the you know, other subproblem and so on. So with this one, we have to ask, uh, so which category of solution does this fall into? First of all, um, we are choosing three out of five. Do we, uh, is it with or without replacement? Can these three be the same number out of the five winning numbers? In other words, if the five winning numbers are one, two, three, four, five, can I choose one, one, one over here? The answer is no. It is without replacement, okay. The second thing is, is ordering important? Is choosing one, two, and three out of the five winning numbers versus choosing three, two, one out of the five winning numbers, does that make a difference? The answer is no, it does not make a difference because ordering of the numbers in a lotto ticket is insignificant. Mm, okay, so I think we got this one already. It is choosing five, Choosing three out of five, the number of combinations, choosing three out of five. What about this one here? It's the same deal. It really is the same deal, except we have 64 to choose from instead of five to choose from. 
So it's the same deal that we have 64 being available, of which we only want to choose two of those as the <coughs> <coughs> as the remaining two non-winning numbers. <coughs> this one here is kind of interesting because you look at this and go like, um, what would this look like? Isn't this just 25 itself? Well, that's one way to look at it. But you can also look at this as we got 25, choose one of those. Now, isn't that just 25 itself? The answer is yes, it really is just 25 itself. But in, but this way we have the same uh, type of notation, which is kind of cool. So when you multiply these together, okay, that becomes the uh, one part of the event set, okay? So this is basically you know, E1, we'll call it the, the cardinality of E1, <clears throat> where uh, this is E1, okay? So now we have E2. E2 is saying we only got two winning numbers, but also match the Powerball number. There we go. So same kind of analysis here, but except this time, these two are chosen from the five winning numbers. These three are chosen from the 64 non winning numbers. This one has to match. So this one has to be chosen from the one Powerball number, okay? So when you look at the, the from the perspective of combinations, yeah, it's kind of the same deal. Five, choose two this time because we only need two of the five winning numbers, but we'll need three of the 64 non-winning numbers. And then this one over here is choosing one out of one because uh, there's only one um, Powerball number and we need to make sure that we choose that one. So that is just one. There's only one way to choose one, okay? So is that really just boiling down to one itself? The answer is yes, that really is just a fancy way to say one, but it doesn't hurt to express it this way, okay? Especially in the context of, you know, calculating the cardinality of our set here. Ah, I can't really write. I think something is not right with the, uh, the tablet's calibration. Okay, I'll try to fix that later. All right, so now you know E or the cardinality of E is really just the cardinality of E1 plus the cardinality of E2, okay? So that's, that's pretty easy because all we have to do is to multiply, you know, these together, multiply these together and then add up those two, that becomes the cardinality of E. But what about the cardinality of omega? Hmm. In other words, we are asking how many ways can we have lotto tickets in this case? So this has nothing to do with winning versus losing. This really is just, okay, these are the, this is the number of possible lotto tickets. Hmm. What would that number look like? So now let's take a look at a lotto ticket itself. Okay. So a lotto ticket has five numbers that you choose plus a Powerball number. So if we don't care about winning or not winning, what price we're winning and just want to know, you know, how many ways we can make a lotto ticket, these have to be chosen from 69 numbers. This one has to be chosen from 26 alternatives. So that means, you know, this is, uh, the number of combinations of 69 choosing five. 
and this is the number of combinations of 26 choosing 1. That is the cardinality of omega. So now we now that we know what is uh, omega, okay, so we'll go ahead and write it out here. It is um, 69 choose 5 times you know, uh, 26 choose 1. So our probability, okay, pr the probability of um, getting 8 bucks out of the lotto ticket is <coughs> 5 choose 3 times 64 choose 2 times 25 choose 1 plus 5 choose 2 times 64 choose 3 times 1 choose 1 and then the whole thing divided by 69 choose 5 times 26 choose 1 that becomes the probability because what we have in the numerator that tells us the number of uh, elements in the event set itself and then the bottom or the denominator is telling us the total number of possible tickets so the chances of your ticket being in one of these elements in E is this much okay so that's the bottom line so once we know the probability and we also know the total number of people who got eight bucks out of the last drawing which is on the on October 14th is about what eh, look at this number here I'm just gonna say it's 5,000 okay it looks like about 5,000 to me so if this is 5,000 and this is the probability of 5,000 so that means I can now divide 5,000 by this probability and that will tell us the number of tickets actually sold because you know that's the the ratio should be about the same so that means you know I can guesstimate even though I don't know for sure I can guesstimate the total number of tickets sold for each drawing just by looking at the number of winning tickets now for and I'm, I'm running out of time now the lotto game is also by law required to disclose the game odds so that means you know instead of us doing all the calculations ourselves you can actually just look it up <laughs> you can just look it up so <clears throat> according to this um, if you want to match any three out of the five winning numbers but not the powerball number the odd is one in 580 and then any two out of five and also the powerball number is one in 702 so you have to add up one divided by 580 plus one divided by 702 that becomes the actual quote-unquote probability um, of you know it should boil down to the same number that we had you know calculated over here but if you look at the uh, the lotto site you can see that it does not give you the probability it gives you the odds of one in blah 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 okay um, I think that's because you know most people do not handle um, actual probability that well but they can understand the concept of you know one in you know so many you know the odds of one in so many I don't know that's you know that's that's beyond me that's psychology and that's poof, way beyond you know, what I understand because you know computers are much easier for us to understand than people are yeah all right okay so this is the end of uh, today's lecture and as I said a little bit earlier I am a little inspired to give you guys homework assignments but I have to do the description well enough so that it can be graded automatically yep because that's kind of the whole point is to have it graded automatically so I will give you the assignment once I have determined you know how I want everything to be formatted most likely that's going to be on Wednesday we are not going to have Wednesday we are not going to have a lecture on Wednesday because um, I'll be on an interview panel the entire day uh, so the next time we meet in person is going to be next Monday 
but I will still have my you know usual um, I will have my office hour other than on Wednesday and today so Tuesday Thursday and Friday I will still have my office hours alrighty I will see you on next Monday but you know you will be watching my video again on Wednesday okay bye bye